Guten Abend. Uh, good evening and a warm welcome to the 25th um, edition of Africa Live and the retrospective of the films by Jean-Pierre Bécolo. Um, it's a really a great pleasure to introduce him again tonight, uh, who is one of the most productive and renowned filmmakers from the continent, from the African continent today, and who is aiming uh, to create a public space that is questioning what we know about African-European relations and how we want to address these relations and how we want these relations to look like in the future. I think that's uh, something that is very much at stake in your work um, and in the perspective of um, how you imagine a cinema to be. So, um, in the last days when we had the chance to talk to each other, I realized that you are not someone who wants to teach how reality looks like, but it's more a type of a filmmaking that interests you um, about how to scan reality um, and try to figure out uh, new ways of looking, new aesthetics, new approaches, and thus new ways to understand what is uh, happening. And it's, um, in a way, it's, it's deeply political um, and the double feature that we are going to see tonight um, has that kind of resonance of that deep political impact. Um, we are going to see our wishes, uh, which is, um, it's not going to be the pilot because we originally thought to see the pilot uh, of a series of 30 episodes. Uh, so it's a production made for uh, television. Our wishes is dealing uh, with the German Cameroonian um, history before the country became known as Cameroon. So it's like the story behind the story. And we are going to see afterwards Naked Reality, which is a science fiction, which is actually also dealing with European-African relations, but on a completely different level, of course. And I won't enter that space to like to compare these two films, but I think it makes clear that in your work, Jean-Pierre, um, the notion of making films for cinema only is only part of a very sh a part of your work. Uh, you teach as well. Uh, you just came back from Colombia where you did so, uh, and you also show your films in museums art spaces and I just wanted to remember first the retrospective last year in Musée du Quai Blanly in Paris but you also did in 2006 uh, within the context of the exhibition Diaspora. Um, Claire Denis was involved in the idea. Uh, there you made, I think it's an installation piece called Une Africaine dans l'espace, an African woman in space. So the idea of space here of our galaxy is as African as it could be European, American or Asian, but it's, al it's also African. And I think that's one of the symptomatic things that you do in your work. And then you did work in uh, Savi Contemporary in Berlin as well, uh, an installation. And Our Wishes, uh, that has been uh, shown in ex as an exhibition installation in Vienna at Leopold M Museum. So, um, just to say, cinema is only one possibility uh, to show uh, films, and you actually try out all these possibilities. Um, we've been thinking of um, showing uh, our wishes first, and then have a short, very short Q&A in between, and then uh, continue with uh, naked reality. Um, but first of all, you might say something about our wishes and the context of it and what might help us to understand what, what the format and the idea really is. Thank you. Oh, good evening. Um, okay, our wishes um, uh, is uh, um, the story of um, 
I don't want to say the first encounters, but is the um, uh, the Germans trying to get a treaty from Cameroonian chiefs uh, just before the Berlin Conference? Um, because uh, I'm not very sure if it's Bismarck who wanted the col colonies or if it was Werman, who was a big merchant there, who was trying to convince him to have colonies. But what was very important for us is that we were interested in the consequence of that treaty or that desire to have a treaty within Cameroonian uh, tribes and families and clans. Um, the text, I received it in 2004. It was written by um, a German uh, lady living in Cameroon. She's been living there for 50 years. She's married to a Cameroonian. They met in engineering school in Eastern Germany. And she's been there since. And then she decided to write this, as she told me, just for her grandchildren, because she felt that they didn't have any idea of uh, the history. And uh, she was also able to to read the Gothic German mm -hmm. and to go to the archives and find uh, some of the documents. And she started writing it. But she wrote it. She's an engineer, but she decided to write it as a television series. Uh, obviously, she did a good job because she wrote 2,000 pages. Uh, but uh, I would say there was strength and weakness, but let's just focus on the strength. Because she learned to speak French in Cameroon, so the dialogues are very, very interesting. And then also she was very repetitive, which is good for television. So I felt that it was good to do something with that. And after I spent my one year there, the residence in Berlin, I felt that I, would just, I should just start, you know. Uh, I got a little bit of money and I said, let's just start and shoot something and then we see where we go. Because as, as you can imagine, uh, at that time, the, the setting was very primitive, it was very basic. We didn't need anything fancy uh, to, to do that. So we had a good text and I felt like we should just start. We start with very little. Um, I mean, we still have very little, <laughs> but um, that's how the whole thing started. And I think it, we just took one, episodes, um, uh, but I'll just say that technically it's not the latest version because we couldn't find one. Uh, I mean, we have it, but with no English subtitles. The one with English subtitles is not really that great, but still, uh, voila. Um, it's it's uh, altogether 30 episodes and you've shot 20, you said already. And um, yeah. Well, we're almost done, actually. Uh, we shot, we finished 10. We delivered them to French television, the TV Saint Monde. And now we almost finish. Uh, we it's in editing, so we're supposed to be delivering the next uh, 20 in the next month, I guess, or two maximum. And wh when is it going to be broadcasted? We don't know, but it should be this year. Uh, yeah. Interesting. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so this was like the third part of um, the third episode of the whole um, of the whole series. I think it's it's uh, it's very complicated to think how many characters are around, who is uh, frauding, who uh, the dash and all that, but they are characters that are connected to a uh, history that we might know more about. Uh, just what you mentioned just now, uh, Rudolf, who will be uh, studying in Stuttgart later on and who will be hanged. Um, yes, so there's always that interlink between the story, of course, of of, of Germany, of the time, of the Prussian Germany, and what is going to be later on uh, the territory of, of Cameroon. Um, how, how can we, oh no, no my, uh, my question would be, what, what does it mean to produce such a TV series? And the public is of course, in the first place, a Cameroonian public. Um, is it a street lesson, or do you want to provoke them to think about 
the past or the national entity or what what do you what is what is at stake i think nobody knows the history that's the first thing yeah, even in books in when in there's no place where this story is being told really so uh, what it was obvious is that um people don't even know what happened to them why the the whole thing is the way it is is so um and it was very important to produce something i would say on the local perspective mm -hmm. uh because it was um um uh, just briefly what you discover i discover personally reading this was that when you hear about the debt for example uh the debt corruption or devaluation all these things that are happening to african countries today it started there mm, just to understand the um, king bell is like the first dictator really and the whole idea started because uh, the germans wanted to sign a treaty and they had to have a backing and he was the strongest one of the strongest figure and character there and he was given money to share with other kings to sign the treaty very quickly before the british uh, because they they came so after it's what's called dash yeah dash is corruption really money is like so um he didn't share the money he kept the money for himself mm -hmm. uh, because he wanted to buy a boat you know for himself a steam boat yeah and uh, and uh, he started manipulating everybody uh, threatening because also at that time this young um german guy was um working for a woman company and he was selling guns only to him because he's the one who was selling stuff and uh and he, he will use also like um the valuation because the value of money was around palm oil and uh, uh and he's the one who decided that maybe we should buy palm oil for less so that people in uh, Bonaberry who didn't want to sign the treaty would be under pressure mm -hmm. and also use the debt because they owe him money and then they come and collect the money. And so anyway, the idea was really to use some of these things to put pressure on people who didn't want to sign the treaty. Mm -hmm. So they were backing King Bell uh, and, and he was feeling free to do whatever he wanted to do and uh, for his personal interest. Uh, the, the, the character of his son, who has already been in Bristol, and who was actually seen as a very smart guy, smarter than everybody, even including the Germans, but he was kind of confused how to behave, um, seeing that his father was creating a kind of mess, and um, but not really trying to challenge him, but not being strong enough, and uh, he. Um, the mother actually suggests that he accept the idea that his father could be condemned to death by this traditional court and and if the father is killed then he can be king and then maybe peace will come back in the community so <clears throat> all these stories are obviously um um uh, is mainly because until today uh, you hear a lot of conflict between this clan and the other one based on mm -hmm. what happened then uh, and nobody really has tried to really understand why and uh, that's why really I felt that it was important to, to do that there is um, like the character and the figure are like two different things and we can see it because uh, like the figure of uh, Auguste played by Valérie uh, um, he um, actually he has uh, what I mean with figure and character he is incarnating the character of the son of King Bell but he is also a figure that asks and like speaks to the spectator um, so, so there is that kind of direct talk to um, to who is watching. Um, what is what is the intention of that? He's the one also to is it like um, a bit your alter ego or is it? Um okay, the story is very complicated to understand uh, because when you start dealing with the different clans and the conflicts and the, this, so and then the people, the tribes, there's a lot. So the idea. And, 
to be honest also is very difficult to have very good actors also. <laughs> so he was one of the best so we had to use him to the maximum okay. <laughs> so we would put a lot of dialogues a lot of text that is not just to give the dialogue but to explain what's going on mm -hmm. kind of yeah You said the screenplay was written by um, a woman, a German woman who's married to. Yeah. Um, did you um, did you uh, search for the for the story she wrote, the, for the historical facts, or is it um, just invention, or is it partly uh, researched? Um, okay, it's like history, you know. Um, what is true, what is not, what is invented, who really knew how people would speak or they would cry. Mm. No, I understand. So, um, I would say it's all based on fact. Supposedly, she has a kind of reference all the books she researched. And then her book was published by another historian, Kuman Dumbe, who published it as a kind of uh, essay or novel. Um, but it's, I don't want to really say it's true because, uh, yeah, I don't care. I mean, it's like, I don't care, but it's like, you have to really make it a little bit work so that you have to take things out. And so, uh, the, the exercise is, was not really to, to, to make sure all these are really facts, but I think, um, uh, uh, she, she knows the history very well and then she has been in discussion with the historians and the, nobody has contradicted her um, in a, I mean, a very big way um, yeah. maybe she's not uh, an, a historian in the academic context but uh, as a as an amateur and she had access to uh, facts and documents in uh, in Yaoundé, she was she was looking for material there, not necessarily yeah. in German archives. I'm asking because currently there is a German, there's an exhibition in in Berlin. It's about a Tanzanian Tanzanian um, chief. He's called I think Magi Magil Magu, and uh, Germans and Tanzanians just uh, searched the archive for a story which is. Closely to what you just filmed. Actually, that happened in Tanzania. No, she okay, okay. The, one of the main book was uh, um, uh, what was the consul name? Um, uh, the German consul in Cameroon had a journal, so that book exists very clearly. Uh, and she, um, you, obviously, okay. For the first ten episodes, we really followed uh, Madame Oyuno's work. But then we felt that she was focusing on two families while they were like six families. Mm -hmm. So then we had to kind of go look for stories for the other families, you know, uh, which obviously she didn't talk about. So, but that's coming later. Uh, but the material we had, I mean, for me, the challenge was more to try to make a, something watchable. <laughs> that was my challenge with all the constraints. Uh, that was, but but the, 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 I didn't have many doubts about the... The, the, the other details, really. Mm -hmm. So your your constraints were uh, about finding a place where you could shoot a studio, uh, or what kind of constraints are you talking about? All, I mean, all, all control, everything. Okay. Obviously, for the kind of money we had, you don't make a period piece. You don't. Uh, f everything was a challenge for sure. So we had to create our studio in the jungle, <laughs> so that you know we kind of. Recreate. We have few drawings and photographs, but uh, um, but we were just focusing on the people and the story. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, two brief questions. One is about: Can you give us an, a feeling for how much each episode costs and how much the time of production, how long the production time was, and then maybe also if there were any problems in terms of censorship? Mine is really embarrassing. I don't know to talk about it. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's uh, no money, really, forget it. So, um, I, I, we, um, because I did it myself, I was just like, okay, I have this text, we had it for like more than 10 years, you know, nobody would produce it, like, for, we, we tried everybody's, like, no, no. Uh, so, I just said, okay, let's just shoot. We didn't even know it's going to be a series, we just said, but um, we said, let's do one thing she wrote, because he had a text, 
and then uh, we, we in the bush we create this kind of little village and then we start like uh, doing this thing and the actors were great because they would come and they would just try to read this all so this it was like a lot of text to really remember and try to to bring it to life so um yeah so money didn't count so now the whole idea was that for censorship i think nobody okay first nobody paid for it so nobody would even ask anything and we were in the bush nobody even knew what we were doing there so uh even in in terms of censorship potential for censorship the fact that it's happening in 1884 people feel like they're not uh, uh you can't hurt them really but actually i started receiving calls and it was like this family because this is bell Okay, the, uh, and then you have the aqua. So I received this call of this guy saying, I heard that you are portraying the aqua in a negative way. I'm like, you know, you haven't even seen it. We haven't even shot it. So I don't know who told you this. But even if we do it, I don't see what you want me to do. So anyway, so there are all these little, because I'm not even a dweller. So it's like uh, I was, I would say, you don't, you don't suspect me to kind of try to privilege this person or that clan. But I think you should really be helping because this is what we need really to get this thing, this story done. So I would say um, uh, we also had a kind of, I don't know, maybe attack from Kumandumbe, <laughs> who's actually this Cameroonian German who's supposed to be the, the official historian of Cameroon German history. <laughs> but I think he just wanted to be part of it, really, uh, more than anything else. Uh, um, but I didn't want to kind of do anything with him because also he's one of the families. In the, so anyway, just to say that I don't think it would be censorship, really, but it would be all these little things, people, and nobody really like saying, let's do the history, let's push it, but just like little, um, voila. <clears throat> How uh, is is Germany involved? Uh, was the Goethe Institute involved at a certain stage? Uh, did you claim to tell uh, the truth about how Germans got the, the Cameroon as a as a um, as a colony? Um, how does it uh, go together with Humboldt and the critique of Humboldt and all that that happened in the last two three years? mainly in Berlin, about restitution. That, that's all kinds of questions that, that um, for me pop up when no, I The good in the only has been great, really. They have done the maximum they could have done. They even act in the film, <laughs> the director. <laughs> so, no, they've been really doing the right thing. They, they gave, I think, the maximum of money they can give, like 5,000 euros. <laughs> But, you know, they, uh, they couldn't do more, really. Uh, they even did, because for the op we did a kind of premiere, and I told them, You know, the good uh, in Yaoundé is really like just a small room. I'm like, you know, you should really pretend that, you know, Cameroon is big. You know, let's just rent a bigger room. So they did all this. They accept all these things. So so uh, at that level, which also a lot of people were surprised. They said, ah, oh, the French will never do it because they always like to compare the Germans to the French. So it's like, oh, yeah, the French will never do this. Like a film that is kind of uh, telling the colonial history and then they come and support it. So it was actually good, uh, to be honest, really. Um... Now, um, I would say, uh, okay, a lot of these things are like facts, you know, but what is really important uh, is, is uh, obviously uh, uh, it, it shouldn't be manipulated. I don't think on any side, you know, uh, the same, like uh, the Cameroonian clan are trying to manipulate. So I think uh, what, for me, just like great lesson to kind of, get out of this you know uh because i believe that like cameroon is living the same things right now maybe it's because they don't know that that's actually happened in 1884 mm -hmm. uh, so i think uh there are so many things that are not solved mm -hmm. you know uh just because nobody has no idea of you know how we actually got there you know so you, you mean in terms of dash of silence towards Uh, uh, violence against opposition to Bolbia, things like that, as concrete as that? Um, okay. When you say colonialism, actually, it's not just the German or the French, it's also Cameroonians, a lot. Mm -hmm. So we tend to think colonialism is the other, you know. Mm -hmm. So for me, colonialism is a kind of 
concept how things are working you know how so and that is still there so oh, when, when people really even crit are critiquing all these things i don't think they're critiquing it with uh, with the knowledge about what it is you know because king bell was like i, I think king bell would have been different a different character that the whole story would have been different uh, and uh, because uh, the character played by Simit is very young and he's really not experienced and king bell is the one actually kind of manipulating him mm -hmm. so uh, yeah i think it's in, in this whole because we talk about it in very theoretical and not conce and conceptual but when it comes at the human level mm -hmm. you know i think there's uh, uh there's a lot to actually say, discover and the title it, it was explained actually our wishes yeah. um it's because actually the um, the treaty was a text, you know, a text discussed, you know, by every party. And uh, but, but clearly, it was the German who suggested the text. And then the Cameroonian chiefs wrote another text called "Our Wishes." Uh, okay, even if some of the elements they wanted in this text, for me, were not really interesting for i mean it was very selfish you know but still because for example they wanted to be the only one dealing with the other tribes so that the german would deal only with them and then they would be the one so they were businessmen really like uh, trading all kind of stuff and they were very rich so and they didn't want like competition from the other tribe. so these are little things but in principle it was they were the germans were very surprised that they were organized and they really had their own wishes and tried to push their wishes because they they, they didn't see that in gabon they didn't see in the other places where they went like people were really clear that we want to negotiate equally our relation yeah. and i think that was important to kind of mention and point mm -hmm. um uh, and obviously m all their wishes were not really respected mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, interestingly, it's not a we don't want to be colonized, we don't uh, just leave, we don't need you Germans here. The wish is to say we want to be the privileged ones to, um, to have a special, like the monopoly on the market. No, that was one of the articles, but the other ones were kind of legitimate. Okay. Uh, is the idea that let's talk man to man like really like a uh, woman to woman I don't know. but the idea that let's be it was a request for equality kind of in negotiation the, the mm. chief mm. they came yeah. with a wish list to the kaiser mm. yeah i think that was it's important because th there's a narrative that say that you just sold the country to the german that's actually so i felt that they kind of uh, were trying to negotiate something fair on the perspective you know that's really interesting and um uh, do you find that uh is there a chance to publish this list yeah, i think that would it's, be it's, it's known huh? the, the it's the, i mean the, all these texts are exist they exist huh? yeah. the, i wish the wish list is exist yeah the treaty also all these documents exist yeah, yeah. Uh, last little question last little question before we maybe yeah please Ah, the wishes? Yes. Oh, I think... Just, just one, give some more examples of yes, wishes. Of what, wishes kind of re, what, what kind of requests, of wishes, what were they expecting from the One of the wishes was the land, for example. Um, uh, it was like they would they want to stay, keep control on their land, you know, for example. Um, they didn't want, for example, um, uh, it was about the, like uh, the, the, which court will rule uh, when there's a conflict traditional court or the German laws. I mean, which laws would apply? For example, in one of the episodes, there's this crisis where I think somebody kills someone and they want to, to I think, uh, the, to judge him with the traditional laws and the German want to use the German law. So there was some of these uh, discussions. Um, uh, what else? Yeah, so there's a few, a few like a few things like this. Obviously, the land, you know, the, they just took the land, and the law became German laws, and then so all these uh, things that like they know they didn't respect all these wishes, you know. But they were I don't remember all of them, but yeah, they were kind of on, on uh, around these kind of issues. 
So you want me to give away the story? <laughs> no, history actually is not uh, hidden. Uh, but uh, uh, King Bell is being condemned to death, actually. But because they could condemn him to death uh, with the Egbo, which is the secret court, because they, they were afraid of him. Nobody will vote against him openly. So they used the Egbo, like the, the wife was suggesting, and he's condemned to death. But his son exfiltrated him. He takes him to exile somewhere so that he's not going to be killed. Um, and later on, he's also he's going to be, again, condemned to death on Ngondo, which is the other court. But no, no, he's about to be condemned. And that's where the German consul, uh, what is his name, will come to stop the ceremony uh, with the army before he's being condemned. Um, yeah. So the, 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 nothing will happen to the chief. That's what it means, actually, at the end. I mean, by the Germans. Yeah. That's actually late because this is the very beginning. Uh, uh, the one, the young, the kid here, this is 1884, 85, just the very beginning of the, um, um, uh, so before the Berlin Conference. Because later on, oh, yeah, there will be like one, the main character who will be against the Germans, who will be hanged, is Rudolf Mangabel. He's seven years old in the, in the fame. Uh, so, and most of people know him. But they don't know his father. They don't know his grandfather. Uh, so, okay. Uh, I think we just make a break here, and we um, we go for naked reality that you made actually in the same year. It's also 2016, uh, right? I think so. It's actually you start a film and then yeah, you they only give the year that when it ends. But <laughs> obviously we started a long time before. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you can tell us a bit about the production of this film that is um, described as imagining urban Africa in 150 years from now on. So this is always like 150 years before us. Um, and uh, in a science fiction type. So what is, what is science, what is fiction? Can you, what do you want to tell us now? Not maybe everything. Um, um, okay, naked reality is kind of a very different thing. It's, um, it's the idea, I mean, um, Okay, I'll just say something very briefly. I hope that it doesn't uh, affect whatever. So, um, let's say when we think about the idea of uh, the the future, okay, w w my idea was that in the future, for example, um, African, some of the African traditions will become very normal because maybe uh, what we see today as I don't know, voodoo or whatever, is now explained by science and we know exactly the mechanism, the scientific mechanism of it. For example, the DNA. The DNA is like, uh, um, in a lot of African traditions, for example, they will tell you blood talks. You know, it's like, uh, it's like blood is talking. Uh, when, for example, imagine that you have a family relative you never met before, but the day you meet, there is a kind of connection. And then people say, no, it's blood. Blood is talking. So I kind of like that because if blood is talking, and then now they explain to you it's a DNA, and DNA is like a code, which is like a language, which is... So you start feeling like, ah, maybe there's a kind of explanation to just this idea of blood talking. So, so if in the future we kind of understand all these things very clearly, because now it's been proven scientifically that blood can talk, one of the diseases in the future will be bad luck. Bad luck would be like having a flu because in the African way, bad luck is, when you have bad luck, they say go and to the village and they cleanse you, talk to the ancestor, and then, you know, like things will be better. So now if they, it's very clear that bad luck is a very clear something we can actually track down and, you know, and see that it comes from maybe this thing you didn't do because the ancestors are around, blah, blah. So then bad luck becomes like having a flu, you take a pill and bad luck is gone. Mm -hmm. So that's a little bit like the, the kind of idea behind. So whatever, 
you will call I'll, I'll call it African religion in general, which is the idea that the cult of the ancestors, the ancestors, the dead are not dead, uh, but linked with the blood, which is a connection with the DNA. So you can create a whole field with all these things by speculating, you know, uh, and that's really what. Uh, uh, what he was as an attempt, really, and on the top of it, um, uh, you, you, we also had to create an aesthetics visually that would really, well, uh, kind of back it up. Okay, enjoy the screening. <laughs> yes. Um. Maybe just as a as an entry point to speak about the film after having watched it uh, right now, and it's sometimes it's, it's difficult to speak directly after after something that is hypnotical at at moments. The music is is really like pulling forward, but also retaining. It's um, there is a lot of things that create a very dense atmosphere, and it's diluted at the same time. So there's. There's something uh, that is very cinematic and not at all happening. So um, at the end, we can see uh, you thank Henrique Gross, who is not uh, anymore. She was part of the uh, team of the Goethe Institute in Johannesburg. Uh, in the team is, as an actor, Akin Omotoso, filmmaker of Nigerian descent, but in South Africa since... 30 years, actor, producer. There is Andy Amadi Okorafo, filmmaker himself, being in the visuals, and a lot of other people that I I cannot remember now. But I think there is a kind of a whole group of people that share something like a vision. Uh, can you can you maybe tell us a bit about that kind of uh, togetherness on on that vision? Uh, <clears throat> it's true that when I decided to make that film, I obviously approached a lot of people that I knew, uh, you know, uh, um, yeah, and um, uh, we talk about Andy, uh, this Nigerian filmmaker, but he's also, I don't know how to call him, he's like a visual advisor. So, yeah, I explained to him what I wanted, and he said, doing a mood board for me, just thinking, okay, we can do this, that, that, so putting together pictures. Um, um, a lot of the actors are either filmmakers, friends, or actors' friends. Um, what is important is sometimes we always think a kind of vertical kind of connection while among ourselves, we have enough resources, but we never tap into them. We're all busy looking for money, while at the same time, we are the money, actually. Uh, because uh, when um, even um, people like Fabian, who's also Nigerian, who is in, the, is in this city, uh, Jacob's Cross. So, obviously, we know each other, we can help each other, but we never really work with each other, really. So, and... Uh, Obviously, maybe because there's no budget, but uh, or low budget, so it was clear that you know they were really very really interesting, and also the interest they were very interested in a film that was kind of very experimental and not just being doing television as they usually do. Um, and Enrique actually, uh, she 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 was at the Goethe in Johannesburg uh, before she went to Cote d'Ivoire and then she uh, okay I didn't have a place to stay and then she offered her apartment and then she gave me all her grandmother's stuff I mean like okay we're using the film um uh, yeah so just like a lot of people around uh, close you know end up being uh, people who who helped the film to be made. Mm. There's, you describe it as well as uh, something of a respectful resource that we can uh, that we can share, actually, and that would be an alternative to 
maybe an alternative, I don't know, um, to uh, the, the application type of funding, looking for funding, etc. So gathering on that level would also be a resource. Um, in Obviously, what, what, people would not give you a whole week, like, uh, you, you know, you, it's uh, one day maximum or half a day, but you have to be ready. It's like, uh, I'll just ask you, can you come from two o'clock to like five and then we do this thing. So yeah, definitely. Yeah, but uh, this also creates another aesthetic. Or wh when you talked about the film earlier, you said you wanted to have uh, something like uh, a d digital rework of imagery, etc. But then that wasn't possible, so you decided something else. And this kind of aesthetics uh, that comes from low budget and collaboration becomes something different. I think also film itself is a resource. Uh, we, we, we tend to mimic what is already out there. I'm an editor, so it's true that when you look at an image, you always have to figure out what will make this image different, interesting. So when you take black and white, I think we have a lot of special effects now in editing suites, but I just thought if we go with kind of just superimposing images, which was one of the very first effects of cinema, and uh, you realize that it's still powerful. And uh, even now we have high definition images and the whole black and white and superimposition takes a whole different dimension. So I think instead of just like multiplying, because the, I was thinking about, I don't want to say low tech, because also we all about talk about high tech, so just like low tech, meaning going down and doing less than more. Uh, so I thought it was very important to kind of try to minimize, like, like to do it on the other side um, and find a strength in, in what is less than what is more. Mm -hmm. uh, in the, the images that you superimpose, um, uh, I could recognize a bit of Berlin imagery. Uh, you mentioned to me before something of Boston. Um, so, and uh, you can see Johannesburg, over there is Vodafone, the tower. And uh, so there is something recognizable that also speaks about an urban space that is uh, scattered or fragmented and things can happen at different spaces at the same time simultaneously and in t back in time and so, um, it seems so easy but it's it becomes also complex on another level uh, d did you know that it would come up like this or no but you just try and then you see and then you decide that ah oh, no it's cool it looks fine but yeah, so when I was shooting, it was in Chicago, actually. I didn't plan anything. It was just trying to make images of this. Uh, and then when you say, oh, I have these images, I can mix them up. And I needed a super impression, but Berlin was perfect, because when you get on the top of these buses, <laughs> you have the, the not just the, the trees, and then you had also the lights. You know, and then it was creating a kind of visual... Uh, um, I think we have enough resources, just that we're busy mimicking what is out there. Uh, but obviously, we don't have always time to research, to look for stuff. So we end up just uh, repeating what is... Uh, and the whole challenge of the film was how do you create another visual space, uh, another visual... Uh, even the idea of in the studio, and then we say, okay, why don't we just keep the studio the way it is, and then it becomes also kind of fictional space. Uh, yeah, so just the idea of taking what is very close to us that is there to, to tell the story instead of looking for things that we don't have. Mm -hmm. um, there's something in um, uh, La Pensée en Mouvement that resonates here, the first film that we've seen on Sunday, um, which you edited out of material of Atelier de la Pensée's this workshop in Dakar around uh, the, the notion of thinking or philosophy as a space of thinking uh, of being together on this planet. And there there is, um, uh, there is uh, Fr Françoise Vergès uh, talking about that uh, actually there is everything uh, in terms of history, in terms of tools, in terms of material. And when you describe it like this, it's, um, it's about that. Uh, th there is a plentiness actually of, of resources. And uh, that's 
this this idea of ancestry of coming back to that but also into into technology so it goes in two directions maybe it's the same direction maybe you can explain us a bit about that yeah it's true that um, uh, um, I agree with the idea that uh, we always try to f to consider that we have nothing or that we we need to catch up we need to so we, uh, even if we always need something, but I feel that we definitely have a lot. Uh, yeah. uh, the time we're spending actually um, uh, making the film is very short. Mm -hmm. We spend so much time in uh, looking for the money or, or but writing, because not doing the, the writing today, writing is not just text. You know, you can do a lot of writing finding the visuals, trying to match. Actually, what helped us with this film is that we stopped for almost a year and a half between the shooting and the editing. And obviously, one day it was very clear what I want to do. But after finished shooting, it was still very confusing. So I would say sometimes it's that time you kind of need to kind of know exactly. But the system, the way it works, doesn't allow you to do that unless you're very independent and you don't... Uh, I'm lucky that... I'm, I'm kind of my own producer because even people who kind of support the film don't really ask me for anything, you know. So it's not always easy to have that freedom to to kind of do what you feel like doing. Um, uh, so obviously it's kind of experimental and then you don't know if it's going to work or if it's, you know, it's going to have any interest or... Mm -hmm. I have still a lot of uh, questions in terms of the visuals, but also uh, about the, the idea of the gender relations. Why is a muse always a beautiful woman? And why do you need to write on her body again and again? For me, <laughs> <you know? laughs> I mean, the character, you know. Um, first you have to poison her and then you have to save her again. <laughs> That's also a structure. Um, but he's a bad guy, you know, so in the film he's the bad guy, so it's not really... Yeah, but you have, to, you have to demonstrate the fact that he is a bad guy and he's abusive and all that in order to get her out of that again. So she is not the one who gets it in the first place and says, uh, no, thank you. Uh, and then she's doing something else. But it's, it's just the question of writing that type of character. Um, yeah. No, the story is not really that. The story is <clears throat> is mainly that uh, uh, it's about finding, getting her own mission to do what she's supposed to be doing. And one of the obstacles is this guy, yeah. you know. And then obviously she's kind of have to free herself from all this so that she can find herself and become uh, who she's supposed to be and do what she's supposed to do. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like the distraction. Mm -hmm. But again, she's not, she's the subject. No, actually, she's the object of a mission that comes to her or, or, or conquers her. We're not all, I mean, I, I don't know if you know very well your mission. Me, I, I'm, it's kind of a difficult thing to know what, why you are on earth. Is she free to decide or, or is something coming over her and missioning her? In, in in I would say in, in the in 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 the concept of the ancestors and the uh, yeah they, they they decide that you're going to do this you're going to be a filmmaker that's it so that's kind of what <laughs> so and then obviously you take it or you don't take it but uh, or you decide so yeah so it was not her um, but she's looking for it like otherwise she wouldn't uh, she, she she would have abandoned. Uh, so some people are born gifted with something. I mean, uh, we don't know why. Uh, so these are the, some of the themes I thought we, it's good to kind of bring. Um, uh, yeah. Th there's uh, one thing that that strikes me about the ancestor, uh, which has which who, he says something like, "We survived," uh, and there's a moment of a revenge or uh, saying, we still are there. Uh, that reminds me of, uh, in, in a black British context of filmmaking, of art, there is this idea, 
we've not been killed by this kind of of white society that tried to eliminate whatever was in us and uh so this idea of being still there means to yeah a notion of revenge on <coughs> in, okay there are a lot of theories about the fact that you know african stuff are disappearing because it's the oral tradition some people say that uh, some of the secrets are hidden in people. Yeah. You know, why do you think, like, uh, they, they, for example, um, a child is born and he already knows how to play music. And you know that he didn't learn to do it, like, anyway. So in some of these stories, the idea that, obviously, you can put kind of secrets in a person to be born, you know, and then he comes with it. So... It's obviously the way we look at the world today and then we kind of rationalize. Uh, and I, I, I want it to be also a little bit rational somehow because it's not completely... So the, the idea that uh, you can hide something in a human being, uh, but a human being that is not there, like who might come. So a generation... Uh, I, there's this story, for example, in one of the tribe in Cameroon, where they say that when they had a problem, for example, they, 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 they want to cross a big river, they're not going to build a bridge. So what they will do, they will initiate somebody who will go to the other world, I mean, supposedly, see how to do it. Because in the other world, you have the past, the present, the future, you have everything. So he sees how, he gets a solution from there, comes back, and then give them the solution to do it. So the idea, uh, because the idea that obviously we have all the worlds, it's not just like this world in a way. So, um, uh, uh, I don't even know what to say. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly maybe what you what what is translated into the aesthetics of the film that you have some kind of different interfaces, where you are all in the one or in the other world, and then you can meet someone in another world and learn something or go back or remind you that there's something else happening that then, then, uh, then being on, on Facebook or whatever, that there's uh, also that could be another world, you know? So uh, the idea of second life, third life. Even the idea of immortality, like, um, okay, there's also this myth um, that is saying that um, the, the battle of people on earth is actually um, the bad guys are the immortals because they don't want us to get the secret of immortality. That's why they kill us. Or they make sure that we go towards death, really, and work against ourselves in that sense. Uh, but, but they know that we can get immortality. So, but they're distracting us to kind of follow that project. So uh, it's a myth you find in the kind of uh, the whole uh, Gabon uh, about the the holiday Kang and all this stuff. So <clears throat> I think it was, um, for example, when you look at the way the world functions, you see that we know, for example, that we want a better environment, but most of the time we work at jobs that kills the environment, mm -hmm. or we consume things in a way we are, but we are com com complice of mm -hmm. our own mm -hmm. e extinction. They say that that's the immortal kind of project. Yeah. So they manage to put us in a matrix where we work against ourselves, you know? Uh, and they are quiet. They know that we are doing the job. They want uh, stopping us because there is this kind of mythological battle between us and them. <clears throat> so I think all these kind of questions, how, okay, which platform, how, where do you bring them? Because obviously you have to break the world the way we see it or we know it uh, in the space. Uh, so visually and just create to kind of find a new paradigm to be able to to address some of these questions you know yeah. so the, the aesthetic has to obviously to at least to be different not to be what you know we know and also build the link because then uh, an aesthetics could be and joined to an idea of uh, technology uh, or science uh, that would be DNA or uh, technology of scanning of uh, transmute or 
um, or change your or shape shifting or something. And on the other side, uh, there would be something like um, an, an ancestral knowledge that you could translate into that. So there's it, it's it's not um, some people say, some people say that uh, what is magic and witchcraft? It's knowledge we don't understand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So knowledge and witchcraft and magic are the same. Mm -hmm. It's just that once you understand it, then you know it's not witchcraft anymore. It's not uh, magic anymore. So both are the same. So it's, it's about knowledge and ignorance. Yeah. And also understanding that you have uh, rituals that would help you to keep that knowledge and not being uh, taken out of the knowledge, what is happening uh, here with our university system, etc. that you are, you are not uh, connected uh, to the knowledge itself, to the knowledge production. It's not for free. It's uh, exclusive. It's true that, okay, when I look at, obviously, without being a big specialist and uh, on all this African stuff, but the, the idea is that, you know, the concept of African religion, you know, just to put it that way, um, uh, I'm always surprised that people have duplicity, I can't say duplicity with these things. I mean, when I look at behavior, like in places like Cameroon, everybody, most of people I know, in that context, believe that dead people are not dead. That's kind of in the practice, but they're all Christian and all this uh, or Muslim, whatever. But they really believe that uh, dead are not dead. Actually, there's even no word to say the dead. They say the ancestors. The and so in the behavior, the the whole idea of connecting with that world. Praying, which is also praising your ancestors, your parents who passed away, it's kind of common. But nobody articulates it uh, because if the, the religion is based on, the African religion is based on the cult of the ancestors, the ancestors, which is like uh, having a connection with them, asking them for favors, going to praise, or um, so all that, what is being, is being done uh, is not really acknowledge uh, and and uh, assumed because uh, the other religions are like um, Islam or um, or Christianity is really the official so people manage those two things without being very clear that they are actually practicing an African religion yeah. so I think um, uh, the, the, the film is an attempt even if it's science fiction and future whatever is an attempt to kind of bring these notions that are actually making the African religion, but bringing them in a form and in a way that would be not voodoo or witchcraft, but like more modern, in a modern way and digestible. In and f futuristic in a way, perhaps. Uh, it's speculating, like say that, the, like when I was saying that uh, people believe that blood is talking, you know? So when you take it as DNA, then it becomes scientific and it becomes futuristic. But if uh, somebody in the village says blood is talking, you say that's witchcraft. So it's just a matter of not knowing. When you start understanding something, it's not witchcraft anymore. It becomes kind of uh, uh, scientific or futuristic. Yeah. I'm sure you have questions. Or Hello. Yeah, first of all, I'm very proud because uh, I'm Cameroonian from Yaoundé and it's my pleasure to meet uh, Jean-Pierre here because since 20 years I was not in Cameroon. But my question is, uh, I know him in Cameroon is uh, like it's known, but he's have more when I see, I see him here, I, I feel more proud because in Cameroon they don't know him or they know him, they don't have this recognition. He have, he must have, like uh, I see him here. So I'm really proud. Thank That's you. why I'm really excited. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you <coughs> for this beautiful film and for the aesthetic of it. Uh, even if 
I couldn't understand why you had to utilize paper after 150 years on modernization. And also, why the poet had to write on the skin of this lady all the time. You know, because it had to be a projection. I mean, this poet would have to project it to, to define his project on another way, much more mo modern or uh, for the future. But the main things to me during this discussion now is why are we from Africa or from South America always uh, defending ourselves in the way we consider religion, our ancestral religion, in comparison to Christianity, for example. Because in this uh, post-religion, like I say Christianity, you have the main actor, Jesus Christ, who have been resuscitated. And all over the world, there are, are millions of people, one million people, who are all the time adoring Jesus Christ, who came back. And nobody, or nearly nobody, has something to do again that thing. Even if you are not Christian, you accept it like that. And why, when I come from Haiti, for example, when I say we have people down in the peasantry, when they have a vote ceremony, they can speak in languages. They can speak back 200 years back to the phone to West Africa, where they are speaking and nobody can understand them if they are not in the means of that religion. Well, my main problem is that all the time we have to consider these uh, African religions or the other world religions as something mean, something that doesn't have any kind of what you say uh, rationality. What is rationality? Rationality is just uh, something uh, people told us after here in Europe, well, in the way you have to use mathematics to do that, you have to take biology like that, like that, like that, but nothing more. Even the biology is what we are discussing now. Excuse me. I kind of agree with you. I don't know what is the problem. So <laughs> uh, I think we are kind of on the same page, huh? Uh, because did you see something in this film that was kind of celebrating Christianity? <clears throat> so I um, to, to to answer the other the first part of the question um, <clears throat> again because that's the second time uh, the the guy the point is a bad guy. So writing on her, obviously he didn't have any inspiration. Just to be very literal, he didn't have any inspiration, and she's the one giving him inspiration. Uh, so she's kind of pumping up her energy and distracting her from her own mission. That's really what it is. So writing is also like possession and marking the body so is becoming yours in a way. But obviously, uh, it's uh, <clears throat> maybe I should have chosen another bad guy. So uh, <laughs> maybe she hmm? was the bad guy. because he was all the time telling him, it's my muse, my muse, but I couldn't see in what, uh, in what way she has to be uh, his muse. The, the first scene, actually, when he's trying to write at the beginning, and then uh, he, he can't write, and then she's doing this prayer or whatever, and then at some point, he kind of takes the energy, and then the mother will also come later and say, stop praying, because praying is also praising. So it's like giving the energy to, so stop praying other people's ancestors. You know, your grandparents are there waiting for your praising and your praying. So that's kind of what, um, but I think I kind of agree with you and I didn't, I don't think there's any Christian kind of element in this film, really. Uh, I, 
don't think so. There, there is maybe um, um, a parallel or um, a similar uh, issue like in Les Seignantes, in the other film that you did, where there is a kind of blood sucking out. You know, you have these characters that uh, get power while attracting all the energies of someone else. And... Um, uh, here it is, there is a, a, that kind of um, soft porn pleasure layer where you also realize, I mean, that's us. We sit here and we watch it and there is that kind of pleasure of watching such a thing and you are distracted from other things. You cannot think. And um, I'm sure you, you did this on purpose, that, that you introduced that kind of uh, th that attraction of, of physicality so that we we forget about the mission too. Okay, it's very clear. People believe, I mean, uh, very clear. I mean, I don't know about here, but people believe like in Cameroon that some people, when you hang out with them, you start having bad luck <laughs> or and then other ones, you start being lucky. So people believe that those things. So it's like... Um, uh, but it, that's what I'm saying. It's not very articulated, uh, and it's just like okay. I, but people believe that this person, since I've been with this person, you know, everything is falling apart and nothing is working. So, so people, the energy but now is not being discussed or articulated. But I think it's the, the film is about to kind of you play on these things people kind of have in their mind and and operate with them. Yeah. What I say is it happens to us here while watching too. We are also oh, distracted. So I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Please. Okay, my question is, uh, referring to my neighbor's comment, um, has this film been shown in Cameroon or in Africa and how often or in cinemas or only art places or Goethe Institute or whatever? Can you give us a, an understanding about that? Yeah, it's being shown, but pff, like... Uh, I mean, very few people come, and like, uh, it's really insignificant to be honest. You know, like uh, we showed it in Yaoundé at the Kanwa Festival. It was like almost no impact. Huh? People, very few people, and uh, I don't say the discussion was not intense, but I'm just saying, you know, it was not really like a, a big event. Um, um, I, I, well, I showed it also, obviously, in a Durban Film Festival, because most of the people were South in South Africa. Um, <clears throat> I would say, the, you know, people <laughs> interest in film is not about what the film is really about. It's about the hype. You know, the, there's nothing hype about this, so that you know the whole town will come and <laughs> so. You, it's, uh, but obviously, the quality of people is always great. They're like the people who watch it, who stay, we discuss. And um, what was really nice with this film, when he showed it at Durban Film Festival, it was the other filmmakers, because they had more commercial films, uh, like the cinematographer, Amanda Dube. Uh, he, he's a big filmmaker in South Africa and everything. But what was really, and Akin, and all these people do bigger films, I mean, in terms of... Uh, but what was very interesting is how they acknowledge that they are not courageous enough you know, and like uh, we just follow whatever, but they wish that, you know, we, we're all more courageous to really go out and do things that are bold a little bit without taking care of the system. So we kind of agree on that, but uh, yes, maybe they acknowledge the fact that I was more courageous, you know. So. I think that's that's quite a thing. That where do you imagine to do uh, experimental filmmaking, and showing it and being distributed? It's really complicated. I mean, it's, it's also complicated in in Europe, even though you have circuits for that, and a spl place like a film museum would would show it. But uh, how would you do experimental film work in Cameroon? Me, yeah, I always ask those who don't do experimental film how much money they've made. <laughs> because <laughs> it's very hard to make money with films. So those who kind of mimic Hollywood, do these things, they don't make money either. So I think it's, uh, I call it, you have been punished twice. First, you don't make the film you want to make. And second, you don't make the money. Me, I'm punished only once, you know, with the money. So... It's 
about about something that is to come. So uh, the idea of science fiction is, I think, as well a way or a tool or a space to think about the future in in alternative forms of distribution, production, friendship, and all that. So. What what did you learn from from the questions that you asked yourself in this context? What what emerged from there? I don't think the film is always a magical kind of. It's like having a baby. Obviously, you know, you, it's a couple. You just there, and then somebody else appears. I mean, don't. so I think the film has this thing because you don't really know. For example, <clears throat> to get the money for this film, I received a call of somebody I didn't know to offer me fifteen thousand dollars. <laughs> How is it happening? Like uh, uh, somebody called me and say, oh, "Are you working on something?" Like, sure, I'm working for on, on, always on something. So, do you need money? I'm like, come on, like, what do you mean <laughs> if I need money? So, <laughs> then it's like, okay, uh, I'll give your name to someone who call you. Okay, okay. So then the call the two questions. Okay, what is where when I, do you want to shoot the film? Uh, obviously, I have to make it very quick because I need the money. So it's like you know, in a month or two. What is your bank account number? And then I receive the money. <laughs> so, and then when it happens, you're like, okay, because you start using the money to eat, and then you feel like, no. If I really waste this money without making a film, that would really be like a curse, I guess. You know, so I had to rush. Bad luck. Bad luck. Yeah. <laughs> so I had to rush to really make sure this film is made before the money's over. Mm -hmm. So, obviously, when something like this happens, it's kind of magical. It's not a lot of money, but it's a lot of money. Like who gives you like you know you don't know a person like on the street gives you fifteen thousand dollars. So I think um, uh, that's why I, I also think you know it doesn't matter. Uh, the energy comes from all these things too. You know it's like uh, uh, you 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 obviously everybody says you need two million dollars. You do all this stuff, but it doesn't mean anything to me like compared to this person calling you, sending you uh, fifteen thousand uh, dollars. So. I think um, we, also... we're being distracted by so many things. I, I, that's how I feel, you know? It's like, uh, I always say it's like life. A film are like life. Like, people are rich, some people are poor. You know, some films are rich, some people films are poor. It's like, the films, you get the idea tomorrow, today, tomorrow, there's already money. There are other films who have been dragging the idea for years, no money. And then, you, so I just think it's kind of magical also how all these things happen. So that's why... You, you okay, you can have the whole discourse, very rational business, da da da. Uh, but also, you should kind of also know that you know energy comes from from where you don't even know or expect, you know. It's also turning around the logic that you won't be paid for what you've done, but you will receive uh, a payment and then continue some other work. No, so you won't be. You cannot count down how much you earned for that and that piece. You would get the money and continue something. So you just have to future. forget about the money because yeah. I think if you start going through all these calculations, I mean, nothing is going to happen. For me, I, I really don't because even if I have money, I'll put it in the film again. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what kind of plan can you make? You know, I don't see really how like. Uh, uh, you don't expect somebody to call you to give you the money, and then uh, you, there's no plan really. For me, I just think the focus is on uh, of on the object of. I mean, if a film is an object, and, and I believe in like, um, for example, to make the film, I had to go to Johannesburg to kind of start, start buying like props, you know, like uh, what people would be dressing. So even if I had an art director, I'll also do it myself. It's a moment where you kind of, it's like warming up the energy, I don't know, just go to the shop and then start looking at things, taking this, taking this. So it's like, like I don't know, like just making sure that you're kind of warming up what will kind of... Um, so you have to be involved yourself and only the film start like coming and then the people also because people are critical in this thing because people with creativity, with inspiration, with motivation. So it's always a magical experience. Mm -hmm. And then when you shoot also, you see people after a scene, you see some people like very excited, and then and then yeah, they're, everybody's getting into it. But when it doesn't work, you also know it, it's not working. So I think it's it's all, that experience. Nobody talks about it because obviously we all in the Hollywood narrative of you know the whole business dimension. But uh, I think people are the one who make films, you know. So 
I think we don't speak about that either because we think it's not as important as like the end product of the work. Uh, that kind of process of entering that space, coming together, and there you have someone with an idea, someone with a camera, etc. But it's not one plus one plus one making the numbers. There is something really a magic thing happening within that space. And if it's 10 days, then it's in 10 days and you will do it. Uh, it's, it's really complicated to talk about that. Um, uh, how, how the language the language is really missing, but there's a longing for that actually to work on that level. Uh, that's what what is counting, I think. Maybe my luck is that I've been kind of producer, but when people hear producer, they think I have a lot of money. It's like, ah, oh, you're producing films. So obviously, producing is producing. If literally, you know, like right. uh, yeah, making something, uh, uh, and also the everything is creativity, even producing, you know. Uh, uh, so <clears throat> maybe I'm, I've been doing it in a very extreme uh, conditions because when you produce in Africa, obviously you have to experience all kind of crazy things. And then it trains you also. You kind of know, uh, you know, you know things like, for example, if I shoot in Cameroon, you have to be careful. When you pay people, they don't use that money to take the taxi to come to, to, to work. So they go and buy land or pay for the woman they want to marry, and then next day they have no money. So they can't to take a taxi, so they will be late. So you, you have to know these things. Um, and uh, maybe then when you, 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 they come to work walking, and then they don't eat because the money is gone. Uh, so, so you have to make sure that two things, the transport is there, there's a bus, and then food is always on the set. And then you have people, because transport is free and food is free, they, they, they come and they say, what are you doing? You're not shooting today. Ah, I thought I was shooting, but you will eat so that it's free. Like, uh, so, but you, you kind of create an ambience where you kind of know so, so that people will kind of be into it, you know? Um, uh, but, but you can't be like, uh, we paid you, so you have to pay the taxi to come to work, you know? Because, so you have to understand exactly where you're working, with wh what kind of people you're working, and what will make your production be kind of uh, nice and with a... So obviously, you, 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 it's very extreme because you're playing with very little money. Mm, people are always sick or their family is sick so there's always a doctor to be on standby at the hospital for them or pharmacists also ready so that you can go and pay later so all these things are like uh, part of the production but at the same time uh, you also have people who can who have a lot of crazy talent but how do you kind of get them to 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 uh, to, to be part of this thing, you know, they are caught up in a daily, like, for example, this girl uh, from the film, okay, she's Angolan, living in Johannesburg. Uh, it, it took a long time to convince her to be in the film. She's been doing uh, some very commercial things, a uh, little bit from videos, and um, so at the same time, she, they, they, she's like a very organized like Hollywood, you know, like uh, even if it's at a small scale, it has an agent, manager, all these things, you have to go send me a contract. So obviously, but you know that it's, um, it's about trying to be professional. But obviously in the context we're dealing with, we shouldn't be even be doing all these things. But you realize that you have to go through all this, you know, you have to sign the contract, you have to do all this, and then, uh, Okay, we shoot the film and it's, she was amazing because she was very smart and she was very sharp and remembering everything and very precise. Uh, and that was compared to those who were more experienced. So she was really one of the best. So, but, and then she didn't, I mean, she, I, I mean, she was talking with the other actresses like, what do you really think? Is it really a movie what we're shooting? So she didn't know what we're doing, like the gossiping, like, what is this, you know? But they were doing it like, you know, very well, and, uh, uh, but they had no idea of what kind of thing. And when the film was finished, um, we had a little problem because in the meantime, she entered a church. So she watched the film and she's like, it's not good for my church. So I'm like, okay, but before you were not in the church. So, so it doesn't interfere because the problem would have been if you have done it after being in that church. 
And she's like, no, no, no. Um, and then I ask her, okay, what do we do? So tell me if I have to cut something and just... Uh, and then she took the film, she looked at it, and then she said, it's okay. But just to say that, obviously, you you have all these people uh, who are in um, not really... It's African life also, you know, like you have all these things. If you wonder if my neighbor sees a film like this or my mother, my... So all these things are like part of, you know, the, the, the questions and the problems and... Uh, but. Very clearly, you have to negotiate these things and kind of, you know, also know because this you know, on the, the other film I had even worse, you know, uh, some of these questions. Uh, but I think w what I've learned is that you 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 don't have you have to forget about everything you know and then deal with these things and take time to, to 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 explain to debate because no, it's, it's not, there's no industry per se there, and uh, when what you do, people don't even understand the art filmmaking. They know the TV series, the stuff. So, um, but I think uh, with time, you kind of end up with a little bit more experience how to manage all these uh, dimensions. And you have a lot of people around you learning with you or developing these things together. So um, the film for me was kind of dark concerning light. Was that planned or did it just come out like that? It had a dense, dark uh, atmosphere. Okay, it's black and white, so that's one sort of thing. It's light. Mm, it's a, okay, it's in the studio mainly also, it's like indoors and um, yeah. the contrast for me was important. Um, uh, uh, I don't know what to say. Huh? So, you, so dark meaning like pessimistic. Do you feel your heart heavy, or? Um, this impression there. Mm. It reminded me rather of Razorhead than of uh, Strangers in Paradise. Mm. <laughs> it's black and white, so. Mm -hmm. It was more on the Razorhead side. Yeah, Strangers in Paradise. Paradise is more outdoors. Yeah. Huh? That's light flashing mm. into the. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah. Yeah, because it's indoors, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's cold, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, do you feel sad or. <laughs> Sorry. Uh <-huh. laughs> it wasn't planned this way. It was, uh, I mean, some of your films had light, a lot of. Seyant is all dark, huh? Yeah, it's all in the it's night. It's all night, huh? um, uh, The other one, like Le President, obviously, is outside, mainly, so... Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. 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 Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. Really what... Uh, it right. was particularly beautiful, true, in the film. Oh, you're right. You're right. We we actually they call it the gamma. In a, we, we push it a little bit for sure in the the black and uh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> yes, I think uh, I don't think the subject was kind of subject of, um, mm, uh, but we. The, the, the studio effect also we shot um, indoors. There, there were one or two scenes we shot outside, but with a kind of uh, decor. But um, yeah, mm -hmm. I think we come maybe to an end. I mean, we s might stay a bit outside if if we want to chat a bit uh, with each other. Um, I I just. First, I wanted to thank you very much to stay as long as you did now with us here. It's really nice for two nights here in uh, in the film museum. Um, tomorrow there is Le Complot d'Aristote playing in uh, Film Forum Hoogst, and the twenty sixth, the nineteenth, is Cartier Mozart which is absolutely a must. You must see this film and tomorrow as well, Conclude Aristote. So thank you very much for being around. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> About the magic, 
as really the magic in Africa came here before 25 years there was discussion just over there where you are sitting that some uh, this discussed if African film really exists or if even uh, if it exists if it's um, possible or or uh, what's that, what's that, what's that? Yeah, for European people. It was really discussion over there. And then they said, no, there is no film. It's not uh, uh, possible, I mean, attractive for European people. And then uh, the Frau Finke, she did this, it's a miracle really. She left um, to um, uh, Fesbaco. She came back, write us everywhere a letter, we, like you could tell before, uh, last time. And then we came together, it's really miracle happened. Now when I see, um, I just feel more than older to see this, uh, this um, power, that the uh, energy of Africa is really existing here. So when I see you film, I have just feeling, because I'm an African person, I can feel really some places which is really African energy, um, uh, history or magic. And I've also seen the way in the your films also the attraction for the European people. So it's aesthetic and has a message. And also sometimes it's difficult for Europeans to understand the place where it is like uh, African energy or magic. That I recognize, I'm so happy about that. Thank you very much. Yeah. My English is not so good, but it's okay. <laughs>